Thank you. Uh, let us continue the journey with our final session on aerospace industry, chaired by Air Marshal N. V. Tyagi, PVSM, AVSM, VM, VSM, and distinguished fellow at CAPS. Air Marshal Tyagi was the former Deputy Chief of Air Staff and Deputy Commander in Chief of the Strategic Forces Command. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Uh, we start the last session. Uh, with uh, four speakers. First session was two, next one was three, this one has four, <laughs> four speakers, and immediately following that is the lunch. So uh, I'll cut short a uh, little bit of introduction and make it point-wise, and it's patchy only to make sure that things finish in time. Now, uh, on, uh, okay. So it's, uh, uh, we're talking about uh, aerospace industry, the sixth dimension. Uh, the link between industry and uh, war waging capabilities of a nation uh, wasn't there till uh, the first industrial revolution. You know, when first industri when around the time was, when uh, USA uh, was uh, and other countries were getting into second industrial revolution, that's the time where industrialization and uh, war waging capabilities this link uh, took off. Samuel Colt uh, created an automatic weapon and uh, uh, planned industrial production of that in 1835. And then onwards, the industry has grown steadily and it uh, now dominates all aspects of the national war waging capability. Now, massive destruction of World War I would not have been possible had the uh, industrial industry and uh, war waging had not got linked by them. I'll now come to the aerospace part, which has uh, uh, started you know, with the First World War, developed during Second World War, and has, in this digital era, has encompassed space and many other aspects, which have been covered adequately in the uh, previous presentations. We had, uh, every nation aspires to develop the industry to have a say in world matters. In India, we followed the socialist path and uh, industry was open to only the public sector. Now, which meant uh, production of, licensed production of goods. And uh, uh, we, if you look at by the Atma Nirbhar uh, yardstick, which means how much is produced in India, then we were doing fairly well. But we didn't develop capability of uh, design and uh, production. We only developed capability of licensed production. With that, uh, our, uh, we became, at some point of time, the largest exporter of military goods. Now, this has been corrected, and uh, the today's policy allows private sector participation, not at the level at which it is desired, but slowly it is increasing. We have, uh, the exports are also picking up, uh, some 300 percent increase in the last uh, couple of years, and the target for 2024-25 is 20 billion worth of defense production within the country and uh, 5 billion worth of export. So if we are able to achieve, and we are, I think we are uh, well on that path, but I'm not sure. Uh, when we have the presentations, we'll get a better view of that. Industrial capability, besides ensuring supply of military hardware, has the following advantages. First is economical cost of acquisition compared with some buying it from someone else through life maintenance support. And this is in case of, say, countries like France. It is from concept to retirement. Full control over modifications and upgrades. Surge production capability in case of a war or preparation for war. IP can be used for next stage of development. And it eliminates possibility of blackmail or arm twisting uh, by other nations. Export of hardware brings uh, uh, direct uh, economic rewards, contributes to economy of scale and enlarges sphere of, in, sphere of influence and becomes a tool in diplomacy. Uh, these things are actually applicable for industry, military, military industry in general. But now coming to the aerospace part, it is the most complex to harness requires large resources, is capital intensive, and uh, any country which can develop this 
successfully can take care of other domains fairly well. Now, we have uh, a panel of four uh, very accomplished and experienced uh, people in their field. First is Mr. Sukaran Singh, who is uh, CEO and MD of uh, Tata Advanced Systems. Mr. William Blair was to speak on Lock in, uh, from Lockheed Martin. Instead of that, uh, Air Vice Marshal Fernandez will be speaking. Then we have uh, AVM Tarun Chaudhary, who is ACS Projects, and uh, Mr. MJ Siddiqui, who was uh, uh, heading uh, GTRE. So I'll introduce the speakers as their turn comes. First one is uh, Mr. Sukaran Singh. He is the CEO and MD of Tata Advanced Systems, as I just mentioned. And this is the largest uh, aero defense company, uh, aer aerospace and defense company in India. It has recently acquired and merged four other Tata entities. And uh, it is both an operating company and a holding company. And it has all the joint ventures with uh, Lockheed Martin, Sikorsky and Boeing are under this company. Mr. Sukaran Singh has excellent academic credentials, having studied at St. Stephen's, Oxford, and having done his MBA in USA. He joined the group of uh, Tata Group in the chairman's office for globalization. And uh, Tata Advanced System and its growth has been under his leadership. Uh, Tata Advanced System is executing Euro, Euro replacement program and uh, which has uh, planned production of uh, C295 and uh, that and many other aspects uh, Mr. Sukaran Singh will cover in his presentation. Over to you. Thank you so much. Um, and knowing that the time is short, uh, very quick thank you for to CAPS to invite me. I uh, really appreciate this honor. You know, before I start, I just want to say that looking at the morning sessions uh, brings back to me um, uh, all the kind of dialogues that I've gone through since we started this company, Tata Advanced Systems, in 2010 or 2009, where uh, India's requirements are so huge, complex. Uh, the technology churning is so fast. Um, our Indian indigenous capabilities are, relatively speaking, limited. And when I think about what Tata Advanced Systems has achieved, in the last 10 years with the support of the Tata Group. While it's interesting, I readily admit it's not enough. Um, and while we are the, one of the leaders in this, in this uh, industry, uh, in the private side certainly, um, I, I really do think that's reflection, that just shows how much more work has to be done. Um, and in that context, I think we should look at this presentation. Uh, while there's many things that I'll show, uh, the fact of the matter is that I think um, uh, we are abysmally short. Uh, we're doing very little relative to what I think the requirements are to make it truly indigenous and to get away from these foreign dependents. This whole Atman Nirbharta has to be seen in terms of true intent and spirit and how to really make it happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and really the devil lies in the details in that. So with that, let me just share with you what we are doing. Uh, but with that caveat. Of course, Tata's have actually had a huge heritage in aerospace. Uh, uh, Mr. J.R.D. Tata, as you all know, himself uh, is the pioneer of aerospace uh, uh, and wanting to do something different, uh, starting the airline in 1932, uh, getting his first pil uh, commercial pilot license, and so on and so forth. So there is a lot of historical legacy in the Tata group, and we all know that. Since then, many things have happened. Um, on the top end, you see all the airlines that you're aware of that the Tata Group now owns, um, uh, lately being Air India and all the acquisitions. Uh, the bottom box shows the Tata Advanced Systems, which is the aerospace and defense company in the group, which is doing many things that I will discuss, um, including the joint ventures that were spoken of. But all in all, as the page shows, uh, the Tata groups are heavily invested in, um, frankly, anything that flies. So, um, l Let me just share with you a brief summary of uh, what the group is through a short video.
Um, the company is comprised of four divisions. Uh, aerospace is actually heavily represented in our company. The first two divisions are to do with aerospace. The, the first one on the left-hand side that you see is aerostructures, where we build uh, large aircraft parts uh, for foreign defense companies and is fully for export. The, all the other divisions uh, mostly have Indian TASL Tata's IPR. Um, airborne platforms, except for instance, when we do the final assembly line of the C295 in the airborne platforms, which is really where the systems come together. Uh, I will describe how we have actually uh, uh, tried to build capability through three different ways. One is through cooperation with foreign companies, as I mentioned, and the aerostructures. The second is through actually our own development, Tata's own development, India's own development, as we have done in the case of drones and uh, loitering munitions, which is under the second um, division that I mentioned, and also through acquisition uh, by actually acquiring technology from abroad. Uh, the, the third and the fourth divisions are uh, also have some air, uh, air Force resemblance, relevance because we do missile launchers and so on and so forth for, for, the, for the Air Force. Let me begin with the first division that we mentioned, which is the Aerostructures and Aero Engines Division. This is based in mostly in Hyderabad. As you can see, progressively over the last 10 years, we have actually literally transferred production that was happening in different countries, whether it is in Korea or the US or uh, Japan and so on and so forth, to India for export, building the same products that were being built abroad, but now in India for the, the global defense OEM at global quality. So whether it is the uh, Apache for, the, uh, for Boeing as a single source, the fuselage, I'm talking just for the structure, uh, or the S-92 helicopter, or the empennage of the C-130, which I'm sure Michael will talk about, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the latest one being the wing for the F-16 fighter aircraft uh, for global export, which is a wet wing, which is a matter of great pride. We are also doing a lot in terms of uh, aero engines, where we've started to do casings, which is a complex activity for GE aviation from these facilities. We have probably a half a dozen plants sitting in Hyderabad co-located. We are on many different platforms globally. All of this is for export. So you can see the blue, whether it's the empennage, in some cases it's the full aircraft, for instance, for the Pilatus PC-12. All of these are being done at global quality and rate of production standards. And in many cases, the teams are uh, proud to say that they are single source. All of this is actually quite important when we think of productionizing and getting rate of production. It is okay to actually develop something, but if you can't produce it in time, then that also defeats the purpose. What the capability that we have built and the thought process was that while we should actually build for global standards to for global companies at global quality standards, but as and when India requires it, obviously these capabilities would be available for India. So now I think we can say that tomorrow if we have a project where there's a rate of production requirement, uh, uh, even if it's someone else's design, we can achieve that rate of production at the appropriate quality because of this work that we've done in the last decade. Just to mention that even in aero engines, we are doing uh, a lot of complex work. Now let me turn over to where we are developing our own uh, IPR. And I, I, I'll just say one thing for a second on that, is that developing one's own IPR is uh, really important, and I, I don't have to say it to you, but, but what I have realized is, because when we started a decade ago, we also were trying to do these joint ventures with foreign companies, trying to negotiate technology for India. And, and I, can, I can tell you, I probably don't even have to tell you, that none of them will give, and it's not of their interest to give what is core for develop, getting into a field. Uh, it's, it's just not uh, going to happen. So I think uh, the TOTs that we talk about, all of them have limitations. Uh, it is only when you develop your own technology and you have your own people that you know that you can actually do all the different things that are required in, the, in India's very complex environment, the customers 
many, many changing needs. And that is our learning. So, so when we actually, I'll just quickly, we have a whole portfolio of products that we are building for the unmanned area. I will quickly go through it, starting with the first one, which is pure surveillance, you know, maybe 1,000 meters uh, type of uh, thing. We are, we are now heavily invested in loitering munitions that I'll just talk about in a second. Uh, we are evaluating building an armed UAV. These are things that we are doing right now. These are not aspirations. Um, um, we are doing a large UAV, and as well as we have invested in buying out the IPR of a uh, high-altitude aircraft, jet aircraft. Uh, let me just mention that, uh, to the extent the, these things will play, that um, I'm sharing this with you just to share with you that it is so critical when we have all these discussions in the morning to ensure that we develop some of these things for India. Today, because we have developed this, we can actually go ahead and do many other things which are variants of this. This, this is actually from a uh, long distance uh, uh, precision uh, weapon. Uh, everything has been developed uh, in India. Uh, there are many such companies that offer it, but because we've developed it, I think we can go up and down in so many different ways. The, the interesting thing about this, of course, is that it is actually uh, a vertical takeoff and landing uh, while being a projectile, while being an explosive projectile. Uh, we have also invested, as I mentioned, on this aircraft, which is a high altitude, uh, 40,000, 42,000 feet aircraft. This, this is completely owned by Tata's now and will convert this into a surveillance aircraft. Let me come to the C-295. So there's a whole portfolio of products that Tata's are developing for the nation. Uh, and, and certainly my experience shows that it is, it is uh, very little relative to what we're doing, relative to the enormity of the problem that all of you mentioned in the morning. Relative to that, I think, and I think we have to look at policy and things like that that needs to change. Uh, I do feel that um, uh, things like uh, the, the how do you incentivize companies like Tata's or other private companies to take risk for development? Because unless we are incentivized to take that risk, we will not take that. And uh, if we develop technologies, but the, uh, the way that the Ministry of Defense today recognizes uh, uh, a strategic product in India is by this thing called the India content. And the India content, which we call IC India content percentage, if you hit 50% or 60%, you're deemed to be actually strategic, actually doesn't work. Because I can tell you that you can hide all the interesting stuff in the balance 40%. Um, so, so as far as getting technology from abroad into India with these kind of policy, uh, it's a disincentive to companies who want to actually do work where we generally get this technology which will then help the customer because you will tomorrow want us to go further, higher, more stealth, more precise, and so on and so forth. But we have to start that process. So there are many things, but some, some projects have worked out. C295 is a very good example. And I must give all the credit to the Indian Air Force uh, and uh, many people over the last decade that have participated in, in making this work. Many people know about this, so I won't go through too much of it. But I want to just give you a flavor of the, the, the depth of the work that is going on in the C295 project. This is probably the mo one of the more deep 
projects being conducted in India in the private sector. Um, and I think to that credit, goes to Airbus for having uh, partnered with us for a decade before this project fructified, but also to the Indian Air Force and the Ministry of Defense. But let me just say that starting from the raw material to the detail parts, to actually the, uh, the MCAs as we call, which is essentially the uh, assemblies, to building the fuselage, to actually then going to the final assembly line, uh, where it starts to be, the pre-file starts, which actually then goes from a station to station and slowly you see the aircraft emerging. And then it all goes to the flight test, the flight, the paint shop and the flight line. And then the flight test of course is done by uh, Airbus. We hand it over to them and then to the Indian Air Force. So what you see on this page is really a, a summary of an uh, enormous amount of activity that is happening today as we speak across two different locations in India. Uh, Hyderabad is doing all of the structures work and uh, we have put together, as you know by now know, the final assembly line in Vadodara in Gujarat uh, where the final assembly line will come up. So all the things that you see um, uh, of the aircraft being built and coming together will be part of what we call the FAL in Vadodara but all the heavy duty aerostructures work is going to be done in Baroda, in, in Hyderabad. And I think um, it, it, is, it is important to recognize that, uh, that this project uh, happened, if I may take the liberty of saying a little bit by luck, uh, but also luck and persistence. Persistence of, as I mentioned, of the Indian Air Force, I would say the Ministry of Defense, um, uh, Airbus, and, and also the young team at TASL, who actually have persevered for a decade. Uh, if I knew in 2011 that production will not start uh, of the first aircraft in India till I think 2024 or 2025, I'm not sure whether we would have even got into it. So it was almost good that we didn't know what was in front of us uh, when, we, when we started looking at this. Um, and just to then finish by saying that it is located in different flower parts. The detail parts are being done in many different places. The assemblies are being done in Hyderabad and the final assembly uh, is being done on the right hand side as you know, as you can see in Baroda. And it is a very deep thing, many different SMEs are involved and so on and so forth. I'll just end by saying that we also do, uh, uh, in our weapon system division, we do launchers, which is uh, the uh, launchers for the um, uh, Indian Air Force. These are the ones that we've, we've given. And and we also have uh, a combat land system uh, a division which actually does um, a lot of uh, complex uh, combat land systems. So with that, let me just pause and stop and thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, uh, we, we still say that we are doing a fair amount, but I do think uh, it's not enough relative to the India's requirements. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sukharan Singh. It's very encouraging to see that uh, a group like uh, Tata's is, uh, is going whole hog in uh, generating Indian IP. It's important because, you know, whenever uh, they have uh, entered any field, they have not stopped at just uh, transfer of technology and what we call license production. They have gone on to the next level. It happened in uh, automobiles and many other areas. And I'm sure that uh, someday we'll see an Indian design and produced aircraft coming out of Tata Stable. The next is uh, AVM Michael Fernandez, uh, who's uh, with uh, Lockheed Martin. He's uh, ex-NDA, 